Hi, this is Mike at Game From Scratch, and welcome back to our ongoing closer look at Game Engine tutorial series. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the JMonkey engine. Uh, if you've not seen any of them in the past, the closer look at series is a bit of a review, preview, and getting started tutorial all wrapped into one. The whole idea behind it is to give you an idea if this game engine is right for you. Uh, there's a little bit over a dozen of them, all available on GameFromScratch.com. Uh, almost all of the later ones now have a YouTube video to go along with it. Uh, as I said earlier, today we're looking at the JMonkey engine. Uh, to go along with this video, there will also be a text post available on GameFromScratch.com. Uh, it covers mostly the same material, just in text form. Uh, JMonkey engine, if you're not familiar with it, is an open source BSD licensed cross-platform Java-based game engine. Uh, the tooling runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and you can target those three platforms as well as Android, and in the upcoming uh, 3.1 version, which was just released in alpha, uh, they are adding iOS support. Uh, so that's a pretty big development on their end right there. Um, again, it's uh, totally open source and completely free. Uh, today we're going to be just pretty much diving in, taking a look at how the engine works, uh, how it's all put together, and see if it's right for you. The first thing to do is pretty much understand exactly what JMonkey Engine is. It's a little confusing what you can start with because it's pretty much two products in one. Uh, you can download it as just an SDK or just a library, a set of libraries, you can, and then you can use your uh, Java environment of choice. So if you're an IntelliJ guy or an Eclipse guy, you can use those and run with it. However, it's also a fully integrated uh, IDE of its own. It's built on top of the open source NetBeans um, Java IDE, uh, extends it with a bunch of game-specific tooling support, uh, so it's an all-in-one download if you want to go that route. That for today, that's actually what we're going to be talking about. However, if you prefer to stay away from the NetBeans stuff, you can use this completely as a library. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to impact you from the tooling availability, uh, because like I said, a lot of it is built into the NetBeans uh, as plugin supported. Uh, to get started, you head over to the uh, JMonkey Engine website, which is jmonkeyengine.org, and head over to the Downloads link. Pretty simple, just pick the platform that you, uh, you're running on. Uh, the only real requirement that you've got, other than one of the three operating systems I mentioned earlier, uh, you need to have an OpenGL2 um, compatible uh, GPU, uh, and probably if you're going to use one of the Intel integrated models, one of the more recent ones, a 4600 or better, I imagine should get you fine. Uh, on top of that, you'll need the JDK 6 uh, or higher, so JDK 6, 7, or 8 uh, pre-installed before you go ahead and run this. Uh, so otherwise, just download the package and run the installer. Uh, no real questions from there. It installs everything pretty much from default. And then when you are done, this is JMonkey Engine. So as I said earlier, this is based on uh, the NetBeans IDE. So if you've ever used NetBeans before, uh, this should be immediately comfortable to you. If you've used Eclipse or IntelliJ, it should be familiar enough. Uh, personally, I rank it way better than Eclipse, quite a bit worse than IntelliJ. In my personal ranking for IDEs, obviously that is all a matter of opinion. Uh, so you may love it or hate it. When we walk around the interface here, you can see a lot of this is NetBeans specific. I'm not going to cover that with a lot of detail because NetBeans itself is a huge product. So I'm going to look at the uh, JMonkey engine uh, extensions on top of it. You see you've got your projects over here. Uh, they've added a code base palette. We'll see that in action shortly on. But otherwise, it's a fairly straightforward looking experience when you're just getting started. Uh, just come on here and start a new project. Just go up to File and then New Project. And you'll see that they've added a set of uh, extensions for you to work from. Most often, you'll probably launch from Basic Game. I should mention all of the uh, you've also got for uh, creating a bunch of assets to go together, uh, but you've got the traditional Eclipse functionality is built in here as well. Uh, but we'll go back to uh, GME three projects and go ahead and create a basic game. Uh, name it as you will. We'll call this one YouTube demo for obvious reasons, and finish. And that's it. That's just created uh, your default app. Now you'll notice I've got some previous uh, work I've done over here already open. You can have multiple projects on the go at the same time. You switch between them over here. Uh, so I just created this guy right here. And now you look inside of the project it's created for you. Uh, a couple important things to note. First off, it's created an asset hierarchy for you. This is where your various uh, things go. Your materials, your models, your scenes, your shaders, your sounds, your textures. 
Um, they've created a folder hierarchy for you, and it's highly recommended you follow this, but you don't have to. Uh, you can actually um, code-wise override all of the default behavior, but if you do deviate from this standard layout they've given you, expect to see some ramifications. You're going to have to code around it to a certain degree. There's some of the um, default behavior assumes things are positioned this way. Another, um, and I would say kind of contentious decision they've done, is when you import a 3D model, the file paths are all brought in absolute. Um, so what they recommend, and this seems kind of hackish in my opinion, but they recommend you to import your model into the textures folder. So then all of the textures for it will be relatively pathed underneath. Then you move your imported model out and into the models directory. Uh, so it's important to realize that some of this pathing is very important. Uh, again, for when you import um, a textured model into JMonkey Engine, the pathing it will use for the, uh, for the materials and the textures, etc., will all be absolute, so it's important where you do bring it in. Uh, your other option is to actually create your model directly within this hierarchy. Um, you will see shortly, but there's support for a number of different formats, and you can actually um, integrate and launch Blender uh, quite seamlessly. So if you wish to work in a Blender um, hierarchy and have your Blend files directly in this uh, layout, it will solve the, uh, the pathing issues anyways. So that's that. They've got this uh, this assets predefined for you. Next up is the source. And I've created the simple source file for you. And we'll just open it up. Very, very straightforward. Um, your application extends from simple application, which itself extends from application. Uh, application is basically, you can think of it as your program. It's the, um, your game loop is implemented in it. You provide a number of overrides for different stages in the program's life cycle and respond to it. It's a very common uh, design pattern. Uh, a lot of SDKs use the same mode of approach. Uh, in this case, simple application is built over top of that application layer and adds a little bit more functionality. Uh, it adds a default camera. It adds, um, oh, what does it add? Uh, it pre-configures a number of things for you. Well, perhaps it's easiest just to open it up. So let's open up the simple application class, and you'll see here. So it's added. Um, uh, frames per second information, uh, GUI font, a camera by default, uh, turns the settings on for default as true, it creates an application listener, an application listener is how you respond to input events, uh, be it analog from a uh, mouse or a controller or um, in response to uh, button presses. So it wires up a couple of default uh, behaviors for you, including uh, exit on escape, etc. So it's a very just basically simple uh, application which I suppose would be why it's called simple application, uh, that you in turn build on top of. Uh, so your default game extends simple application when you use the wizard to create it anyways. Uh, this is entirely optional, but it is the recommended approach. And any of those default settings that they set that you don't like, you can easily override, as I will show in a second. Uh, in the main, it simply creates an instance of your main class and starts it up. Um, otherwise, it is creating a box Loading a material from the, uh, this is built into the default libraries. Uh, we'll see that a little bit in a second too. Uh, so there's a bunch of uh, shaders and such built in. We'll also touch on shaders a little bit later, so don't worry too much about that yet. Uh, maps the color value of the shader to blue. Uh, sets that um, the material you just created to the geometry to that cube we created earlier on. And then adds it to the root node. Root node is essentially the top of your um, scene graph. Um, and then here's your update and your render loop. So every pass through the game loop, this will be called. Uh, it's passed in the uh, delta, the amount of time that's elapsed since. Or your render and your render manager details are passed in here. Now on top of that, there are a number of uh, singletons available for you here uh, all the way throughout. So let me just show you, for example, so this dot. And then you've got your uh, asset manager, your input manager, uh, your state manager. Uh, st states are a way of uh, encapsulating your um, program logic. So once your um, update and render loops start getting horrifically large, uh, then you can start breaking things into states instead and work on a state by state basis. So it's just kind of like um, a functional programming unit. You can break your code up into different states and have them be called as part of the, the loop as opposed to having a super large uh, update and a super large render. So states are a way of managing complexity. Uh, we're not really going to get into that here, but it's definitely something if you're going to start working on a, uh, a more involved example, you're going to probably want to learn about states almost right away.
So this is the default application they've created for you. Just go up here and you can run it with this or debug it with this. Uh, big difference is if you're setting uh, breakpoints or um, watches, etc., you'll have to run debug. Otherwise, go ahead with run, which I'll do now. And when you press run, by the the um, the default behavior here is to load this uh, config settings uh, wizard up. So then you can now pick uh, what resolution you want to run it. Do you want it to be full screen, to V-Sync, color depth, or do you want any aliasing on or off? Um, this gets annoying quick, but it's very easy to turn off, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. Uh, so once it's launched, go ahead and press continue. And by the um, simple application implemented that fly camera for us, and that is me moving the mouse around coincidentally. And we'll pan around the scene. But you can see here um, we have a simple cube and our on-screen debugging information. And I press escape, and we exit. So that is the Hello World of JMonkey Engine app. Now let's look a little bit about how you actually can configure that a bit more. Uh, gives you a bit of an idea too how the programming uh, model works here. So when we created our app, we didn't really do much with it. So now what we're going to do is go ahead and not show that settings window. And that's a matter of show settings equals false. Uh, so now when it loads up, it's not going to give us that prompted window. Uh, if any of the developers are watching, coincidentally, it would be awesome if you would add a checkbox so people could just say, don't show me this anymore anyways, uh, and then we wouldn't have to set this in code. That would be a wonderful change. Uh, anyway, so now that we don't have that window, however, it doesn't have the settings for us. We're going to have to want to go ahead and set the uh, default resolution we want to run at, for example. And that is a matter of app settings. App settings equals new app settings. True. Uh, true is, the true hero means inherit the default settings. Now, this is one of those things I haven't figured out. I'm not a NetBeans user, uh, so uh, I'm getting errors for these app setting class not being declared. Um, in IntelliJ, when I work with in, in Eclipse, when I configure it, I have it set to auto import. I couldn't find the equivalent for um, NetBeans here, so what I do always is fix imports, control shift I, and it will automatically solve that. Uh, it basically, all that's doing is bringing in the proper import setting up here. Uh, normally there's a way of setting this automatically to happen. I just don't know what it is. So I've been doing it manually, which is kind of annoying. So app settings dot put zip and seven twenty app settings put right. uh four eighty. So we'll set our resolution uh, to seven twenty by four eighty. And let's add a title. So, and finally, we have to commit our app settings. That is app dot set settings. And it's app settings, like so. And then finally go ahead and start our app. Now, once that behavior is set, another thing you might want to do is get rid of that fly cam, um, that default behavior that you saw with the mouse. And it's possible you don't want to have that detailed information at the bottom left corner. So the, F, um, the frames per second display and the debugging display, the stats display, we probably want to go ahead and turn those off as well in a lot of games. Uh, now, the kicker is it has to be after app start. But when you call this, this will trigger off into new code. So you can't just put it right here because this won't be called until the program ends. So then what we want to do is we want to configure these final steps in our init. Uh, so uh, init is the initialization code. It's going to be called once when your program is created, and that's it. So this is obviously a good place to, well, do initialization logic. Uh, for example, this.flycam.set enabled false. So that turns off the mouse camera behavior we saw earlier. This dot set display FPS false, and this dot set display stat view false. And otherwise, we're going to keep our logic the same. Go ahead, create the box, set the material, etc. And now you'll see no stats down here. The mouse is not causing it to orbit or move around, and that's that's it. So basically, there is a simple um, but full 
JMonkey Engine application. It gives you a pretty good idea of what kind of uh, the program model is like. And then again, if you want to dig in a little bit more about how input happens, so it's a little bit beyond what I'm going to cover here, um, but you can jump into the, um, the implementation of simple application. You can see uh, how these listeners were set up, uh, what they respond to, how those different uh, displays worked, etc. They're all available in here. It will give you enough to at least just get started. Next, the task I really like to do is the 3D model import test. So basically, I want to see how much work it takes to load in a 3D model, texture it, and display it in the game engine of choice. Um, this worked fairly well, uh, but there were some caveats. So let me just show you this right now. This is always a process that's a little bit um, wrought with problems. It's the, the link between content creation tools like Blender, Maya, etc and um, your game engine. There's always hiccups. It's, it's not without fail that that's going to happen. So let's just go ahead and create a new project here. Uh, same process. I'm going to call this YouTube uh, 3D model demo. And fire that up. OK, so first thing I'm going to do is go into my code here, and we shall Per, well, that's why. All right, let's try this one more time. Uh, and basically, get rid of all of this logic. Although we still want to set. Uh, the, oops initial display window off. That's kind of annoying. So source package go up over here and we shall do some copy and paste logic. Basically I just want to turn most of these off. Oops. Control C. Back. Why is copy and paste not working? Yep. So this one we may actually want to keep. Uh, all right, so we'll go ahead and run that. And now we should just get a blank. Why are you up? All right. I just edit the wrong source file. No? Oh, sorry. My brain. Need to copy this in as well. Let's just grab this all. Ah, so it will do auto imports when you paste code in, but not when you type it. There you go. So we got a very empty black scene, um, but I still want the details being shown down here. And that is perfect. So now what we're going to do is go ahead and import our model into this scene. And this takes a couple of steps. Uh, first off, and I'm not really sure I get the logic here, but if you come into uh, your assets project right here and go into, say, the models folder, we're going to do a right click, new, and then go down to other. Now, this is an important little window that's hidden away. A lot of the functionality of JMonkey Engine is actually tucked into this guy right here. Uh, but this allows you to create uh, the various things that JMonkey Engine uses. Uh, scenes, materials, uh, UIs, uh, but in this case we want to go ahead and create a Blender model here. Now one of the kind of neat things about uh, JMonkey Engine is it actually ships with a copy of Blender hidden away. Uh, so if you go to the install folder, uh, which is right here ish, J Monkey platform, you'll see there's actually a copy of Blender 2.69 in here for you. Uh, so even if you don't have Blender installed, there is a version there, and they even ship the version that works best with their product. Um, but you can come in here and create this box prepared for UV texturing. We'll go ahead, we'll add that, and we'll go we'll call it my, so technically a cube. So my cube, it's going to go into the asset slash models directory, and we'll just go ahead and create that, and it'll automatically fire up Blender. 
Now I have Blender installed on my machine, it's 2.73, whatever the current version is. And if you notice, this will come in and it'll actually launch um, their instance. So this is 2.69 that we're seeing running. And it's configured, I don't know why they did this, but they've got their modified view and this pre-textured cube is set up for you and is configured in a way that JMonkey Engine wants. Basically that means it's got these four named materials already set. So your diffuse channel, which is basically you can think of it as your um, your texture or your decal. Uh, this is the, the color on the surface, so the texture map basically. Uh, normal, which is for your normal mapping for giving illusions of depth. Uh, specular, which is for your light and parallax. I'm actually sure what parallax is in this particular example to be honest um, but that's the biggest thing they've done here is they've set up this cube for you and these four texture um, already configured for you now what I find a little odd is it's not a textured cube and there is no material applied to it or anything so it's called over here a texture mapped cube but it's not actually texture mapped so there's a couple of steps you're gonna have to do to get this guy in with a texture attached uh, first things first we're actually gonna have to unwrap it uh, so in edit mode, with this window selected, plus A, so that you've got all your cues, and then just do a mesh, UV unwrap, and we'll just go over the smart unwrap project, and see there, it's basically flattened it, so we can do our texture on top. So that's step one done. Step two is you need to enable the diffuse channel by checking this box right here. Uh, step three is we're going to have to go ahead and actually create a texture to go on top. I'm just going to use a built-in color grid texture for this. So let's go new, and we'll call this my texture like so and what did I do wrong here yeah, I'm mildly confused that should have given me different options uh, let's delete that try that again new oh okay I did it wrong. My texture. And then right here, this is what I, I did wrong. In your generated type, drop that down and pick color grid. Um, I'm thrown off a bit because they've modified their user interface to their end. I, I really don't understand why they wouldn't have just kept the default blend layout. Uh, this is just adding a layer of confusion. Um, so uh, there, so we've created the default texture twice. Um, now go on over here and we set it as active. So now you can see this texture is applied to this cube. This one final step is back here in your material section, expand out mapping, drop this UV and select UV map under the maps for right here. And then in your image editor, do image and we'll do pack as ping, so which saves it as a ping texture, but internal to the blend file. Uh, so in theory, that's everything we need to do. We've now created a textured cube that we can use in our um, in our game engine example. Now, one thing is, and I'm very briefly only touching on this stuff. Blender is a completely different subject, a massive subject on its own accord. Um, if you don't know anything about Blender, and you're interested in learning more. There's actually a set of two complete tutorial series on Game from Scratch. One is uh, about a 22-part text-based series that walks you through everything you need to know uh, to basically create uh, game-ready assets, both 2D and 3D. And if you prefer video, I've actually done a six-hour video series on getting started with Blender as well. Uh, it's also available here on the YouTube channel. Look for the playlist for that. So if you want to learn more about Blender, I got you covered there, but I can't go into much more depth here because we're going way off topic on that. Uh, so once you're done, click here, save it. So the asterisk is done, and we'll flip on back to the JMonkey engine, and you'll see um, it'll be a version of it right here. Now, Blender is configured to automatically create a backup version, Blend.1. This is basically uh, the previous instance. Uh, you can safely ignore it. You can also turn that off if you wish. So we now have this Blend file in. First thing we can do is test to make sure it actually works. So right-click it and click View Model. This will bring up the internal model viewer, which by default, strangely enough, has no lighting. Now. Our blend file could have lighting information and it doesn't. So if you need to see if it actually worked, click this little light icon here and this will add an ambient light to the scene, like so. so there you go. So you see we have successfully imported a 3D textured object into JMonkey Engine. Uh, you can switch here to um, change between wireframe and textured. And I'm not entirely sure what the eye does, to be honest. I thought it was uh, perspective versus orthogonal, but I may be wrong on that one. 
Um, but be sure to click this guy if you've got no lights in your scene, which that default scene does not, because uh, otherwise you obviously won't see it. So toggle it that way. But you can see, at least the JMonkey engine, our blend file is valid and textured. Uh, so now we need the code to actually import this guy. And it's going to be a bit of a step. First off, it's implemented as a plugin. Um, there's a couple of plugins that are not installed by default. Don't worry, they're very easy to add. But the first thing we're going to have to do is actually add uh, the plugin support to our project. And to do so, right-click on your libraries file down here and go Add Library. And locate JME3 Libraries Blender and add that. And that's it. So now that plugin is now integrated into our um, application. Uh, remember how to do this for later on, too. So I want to show you uh, these guys in a few seconds. We're going to have to actually come back in here. Uh, so now let's go ahead and load a Blender model. This is fairly straightforward. So instead of where we created the box before, we shall go ahead and go. Uh, so the top level unit in the scene graph um, is a spatial. Um, so it basically, in a lot of game engines, it'd be thought of as an entity. The root visible node that has a position in 3D space is a spatial object. And that's what we are going to create, like so. Oops. Blender model equals, and then that uh, manager I showed you earlier, load model models slash my cube. Oops, cube dot blend. So simply load the model and add it to our scene. So root node dot attach child blender model. Again, it's the imports. Why are you surrounded? We're good. All right, go ahead and run that. All right, perfect. So that's working. And believe me or not, this is actually our model being displayed. Now we're running into the same problem we had with the texture viewer. So we don't have a light in our scene yet. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and add one now. I'm going to show you the advantage of this little palette over here. So let's just give ourselves a couple lines of code space and what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a light so this basically can be thought of as like code snippets we're just going to go ahead and add an ambient light so you just pick what you want bring it in drag and drop now the annoying thing is the indentation is always wrong i'm not particularly certain why so we'll tab that out and we will tab this one in like so and then once again we'll fix our imports and done. So now we've just added an ambient white light to the world. Now the light as well um, inherits from spatial. So uh, it can again be added to, it's got a position, it can be added to the scene graph uh, the same way. Let's add them in the same spot though, a little bit cleaner. All right, perfect. So now let's go ahead and run that. Okay, that was not what I was expecting. One second. All right, this is what I get for going off script. Uh, for some reason, in my other code example, I actually did it with using sunlight. We'll bring in the sunlight code example. And again, fix the indentation. Yeah, so that's adding the sun. And then we'll go ahead and run this. So I'm not sure why ambient light didn't actually work. It should have been fine, but now we see it. Oh, I can't, I turned off the fly cam. So let me just go back and turn that back on. Oops, wrong one. So there is our model imported and running. Now you may notice some uh, texture artifacting going on. Uh, that could be one of two things. First off, I'm actually running this on uh, an Optimus GPU. Uh, so right now I think it's running in Intel mode. So this might be partially the Intel uh, GPU at work, uh, but my money says that's actually an anti-aliasing artifact while you're not seeing the grid. So what you probably want to do is uh, disable texture filtering and it will look more like the original source. But there is a textured model imported into uh, JMonkey Engine, uh, fairly simple. Uh, with a couple of gotchas. So make sure that you bring in uh, the plugin. Uh, that will in turn extend this asset manager 
Uh, you can also add new loaders to the asset manager if you prefer to go that route. Uh, but if you don't bring in that library, obviously none of this will work. Um, this code will just fall on its face. Uh, but otherwise, the process is fairly simple. Now, it is important though to pause for a second and mention that you probably don't want to use blend files in a real game, uh, at least uh, in a sophisticated or I suppose even just a non-trivial game. Uh, the blend file format is not optimized for game usage. Um, it's just not really the ideal there. So what you probably want to do is convert it to their internal format. And now the nice thing is they actually provide an importer for you. Uh, you can bring in, uh, so file, we can go to, oops, let's go back uh, to our models, go new, other. We can actually bring in, where did it? No, wait, it's, a, it's up here. File, import model. Uh, what am I using? YouTube 3D model demo, right? So, and this brings in their importer. So we can come in and load. All right, a bit of delay there. Uh, but we can load our asset into here. We actually definitely have something that's still populating. Let's make sure the antivirus or something didn't kick in. Nope. Let's start this process over, see if it fires up a little faster. Uh, you'll run into little things like this every once in a while. Uh, let's go in, go down here, select open. Why is there nothing there? Okay, there was actually nothing there. All right, that was my uh, stupidity. Uh, let's go into uh, downloads. There'll be a model there. I think. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure if it'll bring in an FBX or not. Let's try that out. That's a eight megabyte file, so it's taking it a second to. Let's zoom that out, see how that turned out. Not great, to be honest. Uh, but it's actually using uh, Blender, I think, as the underlying converter for Collada files and FBX files. And frankly, Collada and FBX don't do a particularly great job on this process. Um, we could have also equally brought in a model file from Blender, etc. And it actually works a lot better uh, because ultimately it's Blender that's being used behind the scenes there. Uh, but a much easier approach to it is you can actually take your existing file. So like this blend file right here, I can just right click and say convert to J3O uh, binary, which is their built-in format. So now we now have um, a binary uh, performant version of our model, but in JMonkey Engine's format. And... Uh, I'll actually show that in a second. Uh, so that's pretty much your process here. And one thing before I move on, um, this is a bit of a mistake in my opinion. I'm not entirely certain why they went this route. Let I me mean, just get rid of this and I'll illustrate it for you. Um, when you're working with this code palette over here, you might find that you sometimes bring things in and they simply don't work. For example, uh, let's load a model. This one will do it. You load model and it's bringing in this um, now let's fix these imports. It's bringing in this teapot. Now I go ahead and run this and kaboom. Exception teapot now found. So if you're gonna start using these particular palette items, you might find sometimes they depend on a shader or an object that isn't by default in your scene. Now it's the same thing, go into the libraries right here. I go add library and then add in this JME3 test data, like so. And now you run it. And it works. So uh, I'm not sure if you're going to include these palettes, why you don't automatically bring in that library. Uh, but if you use these, keep in mind they might have dependencies on some code that isn't automatically linked in. So if you do run into an exception like that, uh, be sure to check your libraries. Make sure that the right ones are included. Now, another powerful feature of the JMonkey engine is actually their material or shader support, which is kind of uh, hidden away and made easy for you. Uh, you'll notice like right here, this is loading up uh, a material for our uh, teapot object uh, from the common folder for uh, it's a show normals uh, material. Now what if we want to go ahead and create one of our own? It's very simple and this is encapsulating shader programming for you so you don't really have to get that into it if you don't want to. 
you can just come into your materials if you went, uh, like once again add new and you'll see the most recently used ones end up getting shown up here and here's actually what we want but I'm going to show you the full process uh, material an empty material file uh, you can also create a template for if you're using a lot of the same base material that we're working with and I'll show you here the template is going to come into effect in a second uh, so we'll call this my material like so and right here, you can see that the material definition is coming from a template. So you can create these yourself if you wish. But we're going to use, uh, um, yeah, we want lighting. So if we want lighting support, we'll go ahead with our base template being this, this one that supports lighting. And this is set to automatically save every time we make a change. And what we're going to do here, a uh, very simple template, uh, very, sorry, it's very simple material. We're just going to have this as a wireframe renderer. Um, so as you can see, there's a number of settings you can set. Um, light map, normal map, your uh, ambient diffuse specular colors, uh, your diffuse map, environment map, shadow maps, color ramp, etc. Just come come in, uh, set them, pick the texture you want to apply, and you're done. However, oops, I didn't do anything. Click cancel. What I want to do in this case, very simple, is come back over here. Uh, no, it's over Adventional Render State. And we'll just turn wireframe on. So basically, here is your shader being previewed in real time. You can see it applied to a cube or uh, a quad. And there is the result of our shader in action. And that's all we're going to do. We're just going to create this very simple uh, wireframe rendering material. And you should be able to, yeah, click over here. You can see the, the source of the material you've created. This is their um, scripting format so that it can be compiled into the various different uh, required GLSL or HLSL requirements. Um, and again, this is inherited from the template, which you can see here is where that's coming from. If you want, you can go open up that file if you wish to see a little bit more about how these work. But uh, in terms of creating a simple shader, that's really all that's involved. Click back to the editor. It saves automatically, so that should be done. And we'll just go ahead and close that. So now instead of using this material, we'll come up here and select materials. I'm going to call it my material, I think. Material, my material, J3M. And go ahead and run that. And kaboom. Okay. Uh, it should occur. creating a new material. Instead, we, we want to load it from, because it's an existing asset, we want to load it using the asset manager instead. So asset manager, dot load material, materials, my material, like so. And now let's run that. And there you see, we now have, zoom that in. Our material is simply oops, a wireframe, like so. So that's how easy it is to create uh, shader materials inside of JMonkey Engine. A uh, nice little feature just kind of tucked away in there. Now the final thing we're going to look at is their, um, their scene support. They have a world placing uh, editor built in here. You can create scenes and then load a scene with a single line of code. Um, and they've got a tool there for basically placing your entities and objects in that scene. And let me just show you that process right now. Uh, now I will warn you, probably in terms of um, JMonkey Engine features, this is a very nice one, but it's also probably the least polished one, um, as you will see shortly. So we're going to go down to our Assets folder to the Scene section. We'll go New, Other, Scene, Empty, JME3 Scene. And sure, we'll call it New Scene, that's fine. And this brings you to this view by default. It's the same you use basically for the model viewer. Um, except for now you've got controlling user or pers uh, perspective, orthogonal, or top left front, etc. camera view. We'll stick with user. Uh, you can use the mouse to orbit and move around and pan, etc. Uh, right mouse button pan, middle mouse button, uh, sorry, scroll wheel zoom, and then middle mouse button orbit, and left mouse button orbit as well. Uh, so those are your basic navigational controls. You can see your three axes here. Uh, this is your up axis, this is your Y axis right here, Z, X. And now that you've got your scene, you can go ahead, you can define uh, collision shapes for physics, etc. You can set your weights and properties. 
uh, but it's easy now to instantiate objects into your scene. So example, we have this my cube that we created earlier. You know, right click that and say either add in or link in scene composer. So I'll add it in scene composer. So now you'll see we have this new node inside of our scene right here, which is our cube. So we need to go here, we'll turn, let's see, lighting on, texture on. So we now have a cube in our scene like so, and we can go back to the root of the scene again, and we can add another one. Now we have two of them. I can take the second one, and let's see, grab that guy for move, and we shall real on that X. So you can quickly assemble your world of entities here using the scene composer. Um, as I said, it is a little rough uh, at times. You've got your properties over here. Now where it kind of falls apart a bit is now let's go ahead and so far we've been depending on default lighting. Like so. So the only reason you're seeing that guy is because it's active. And then here you see we had a bit of a legacy uh, visual effect game getting shown here. So let's turn our lighting back on. So instead, let's add a light to the scene. So the root of our scene selected, right click, and we'll do add, we'll add a light, and we'll add a point light to our scene, like so. So now, if I can turn the default lighting off, you'll see we are now being lit by this point light. Now, the challenge is I want to move this point light, and, well, frankly, I can't. I can't even see where it is at this point. In order to actually modify the point light, I'm going to have to select it here, and then, unfortunately, move it by hand. Uh, using coordinates up here. So let's move it to 5 up the y-axis. So now you're seeing it's located here a bit. If I do it a little bit more, if I zoom in far enough, we should be able to locate the little light icon somewhere. I don't see it yet. The widget for a light is very, very small. Let's move it up quite a bit. All right, I have no idea where it is. Uh, but as you can see, the, the interface for, in this example, modifying and moving and positioning lights is not ideal. Um, it's you know definitely one of those things that can be worked on. Um, it has been identified as a problem. Unfortunately, it was identified as a problem in 2013 and still seems to be a problem. So it's little things like this. It's a little lack of polish that definitely they need some work here in the scene composer. Uh, now, there are, of course, strengths that I haven't shown yet. One big thing that they've got is there's actually a uh, landscape uh, built in here. Right here, this is selected. Now it's not, it's technically a completely different window. We select our scene here. Let me make sure I've got it selected here just in case. And you click up here to bring up the uh, landscape editor, or the train editor instead. So you can see the world's in it. Now we can go ahead and we'll add a train to our, add a train to our world. Uh, pick its default size and the patch to create with. And we can start with either flat um, you can run use a, a normal map brought in, or you can start off with a hill. We'll start off flat. Set the default texture. So boom, we now have a terrain added to our our world, and you can now use the terrain editor to go ahead and edit the settings. So we can go here, uh, increase our radius slightly, and start raising the world up, like so. We can. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, sorry, my email is still on. Uh, we can add new textures, multiple textures to the surface. So let's go and add another texture layer here. Pick a different texture. And the default. So let's go to train here. Pond. And add the pond. And we'll set its normal map to, again, train, pond, normal. And now we can paint with the second texture. So let's go to the spray brush tool here. Pick the texture. And now we're going to that pond texture inside of this watery basin like so and we'll save that guy and let me shut that down and flip back over to our uh, scene view here and there you can see so now we've got our entities that are existing within our terrain easy enough uh, I can go in here grab, grab this guy for example why are you not in movement there we go Why are you not moving? All right, come on. Grab the cube. Move mode. Yeah. 
and we can place our entities within the world. And so, oh, so there's fun. There's our light that I was modifying earlier. Uh, we should be able to grab it and drag it around. Unfortunately, you can't as of yet. But there is a very powerful world placement editor tool built in here. It is just a little rougher on the edges at times. Uh, there are there is physics support on top. There's vehicle support on top for your physics systems. Um, I have pretty much everything you need is in here. It just does need a layer of polish, definitely. Uh, but now that you've actually gone ahead and got this scene, it's very easy to work with. So we'll just close that guy off there, make sure it's saved up, and let's head back to our code. And we'll just get rid of all of this. Nah, we'll need you in a second. So bring over, load the scene. Wow, that's way more complicated than it needed to be. All right, well, we'll assume that works. Um, let's see, imports. This is certainly a pet peeve of mine, but I'll fix the indentation. And I'll just add it right there. So we'll go ahead and get rid of that. So that is a scene loader snippet. I actually did the same thing basically in two lines of file. Uh, I just used, um, used, I think, asset loader load scene, but we'll use the snippet version instead. Path not found. Scenes. Yes, this this pathing is bizarre. All right, let's not use the snippet this time. We'll do it the way I did it last time. I think it was just. I think it's model, but I don't think this was it. Give it a shot for a second, but oh, that's wrong, anyways. We're going to need a. I did just kill all the light from our world, too, but I don't think that was right. Uh, ladder sun back in. So, six imports. Run. Yeah, that's not it. Uh, give me one second here. All right, perhaps it's a good idea to actually add that to the scene. So, uh, root node.add attach child. Attach child. So I'm not really sure what that snippet was about. This is much easier and more straightforward. Uh, go ahead and run that. And there you go. Let me try and get orbited to an angle that... All right, I'm not going to get a good angle because we're underneath it. Let's just set it. Set local transform. Translation zero minus ten zero. Yeah. And there is our scene loaded. And this is hierarchical, so we could actually add another element to the scene by basically attaching it to the world. Uh, so if we wanted to, we could now go move that object logo. Oh. Did it again. All right, let's get rid of that guy. Wrong one. I want the model loader. 
Load model. That guy. Six. And instead, we will go world. Okay, a bit of a goof on my end. Uh, you can actually add it as um, the problem here is I loaded a world in here as a spatial. And this is actually an important thing to cover, so it's a good thing I made this mistake. Um, and I said spatial is anything in the world. And that's not technically true. There's two top level um, containers in um, JMonkey Engine Scene Graph. You've got spatials and you've got nodes. Uh, spatial basically in turn owns something like geometry. So it's visible and exists in the world. It's a spatial. Uh, however, what you often have is containers. Uh, so what you'd want to do all the times is have um, a container that owns various other containers, which owns various other spatials, etc. Uh, which is this guy here, for example, as you can tell by the name, root node is a node. So if you want to have parenting information, uh, you organize your collection of spatials into nodes, and then your nodes in turn have um, children you can attach to. So this example here, we're attaching directly to the root node with the teapot we just created. And we'll go ahead and run that. We can see our level is loaded. Our teapot is there as our models that are instanced as part of our scene loader. Uh, we can also have done it this way. So it's going to, uh, okay, the, uh, the import's already there. So the node, you can go attach child. And you can attach the world to it, or you can do node.attach child t pot. Or we could even go node sub node equals new node sub node.attach child t pot. Like so and create basically a hierarchy of entities that way. I don't know if I'm get rid of that guy there. And go ahead and run that. And same end result. But that is how you can in turn create your um, well, your graph portion of a scene graph. The, the relationships and the, um, so if you want things to move in a likewise manner or be parented collectively, then you would use the node. Uh, if you want it to be displayed, and then in turn, you use the spatial. And the spatial also then has attached to it things like geometry. Geometry in turn has textures attached, etc. And that's how that general hierarchy works. So I'm kind of going running long here. I'm already at the 52 minute mark, but I hope you've seen a bit of an overview of what's there. Um, Obviously, I can't touch on even 10% of what this engine is capable of. And for the most part, uh, it's a modern 3D engine that's been under development for a very long time. So if you think the functionality is there, it probably is. Um, as you saw from some of the tooling, though, there is a layer of polish that needs to be added. Uh, that scene manager, it, it's definitely a nice feature having this functionality in. Uh, but it, it's definitely use a touch up or two. The, the light should have control figures attached. But the results are definitely there. And if you do need a world editor, especially for simple placements of entities into a scene world, and then you want to use that, um, the results as a single collective file, uh, you can. It's there. The tool is there. It works. But as I said, it could definitely use a layer of polish. Um, I don't foresee, especially if you're creating an, uh, an indie style 3D game, JMonkey Engine definitely could work for you. Uh, we haven't talked about a couple of the intangibles yet. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is open source and completely free. Um, Support-wise, there's a couple of books available. Uh, I'll link both of them on GameFromScratch.com in the text version of this. Uh, but it's nice to see that level of support available. Uh, as I said, it's been around for years, so there is a maturity to it. Um, at the same time, there's a very solid wiki. If we go to the web page here, you can see here's the explanation of uh, spatial versus um, nodes uh, as an example from the wiki. Uh, the wiki is very solid. Um, let me see if I can jump back to the... No, I can't. There, I can get it this way. Let me flip over. There. So here is your root level documentation. They've got a set of tutorials uh, going from beginner, covering all the basics that you need to get started, uh, up through intermediate and advanced usage. Uh, the wiki is quite solid. On top of that, there is uh, documentation available. 
me see if I can. I always went straight with Google. So, um, uh, nice Java doc version. This is one of the things I love about working with Java projects. Is they're almost always well documented in this form. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and see the documentation for a sort of example, an action listener, it is available. Uh, you can see the clusters that uh, implement it or that it inherits from. It's a very nice documentation system. Almost every single Java library I've ever dealt with is a nicely documented as a result of Javadoc. Uh, so anyways, there's a nice, complete uh, reference library available for you here. Um, you will run into a few things. I ran into some situations where code has changed over time. You're going to run into that. It's, it's an old... Um, old enough um, game engine that there's going to be a lot of history there. So things that are no longer accurate or no longer true. That's bit me a couple times, but it's not too bad. Uh, one of the glaring problems, or two of the glaring problems, that used to exist with JMonkey Engine that they've recently just addressed, uh, one of them they literally just addressed with the 3.1 release, is they moved on to GitHub. Uh, so the code is now under a more liberal um, uh, BSD license and it's available on GitHub, which is very, very nice. Um, so if you do want to get into the code, it's a lot easier now. Uh, they've also migrated over to Maven. Um, I have mixed feelings about Maven. They used to be on Ant, which I've actually always found worked a little bit better, but that's more of a, an implementation detail for the game engine guys, so it shouldn't really affect you. Uh, but if you're using a Java tool that uses Maven, which is basically all of them, um, downloading and maintaining a JMonkey engine install should be a breeze for you. Um, the other big thing that they've just recently done is they've moved to a good forum software. Up until, I don't know, even probably six months ago, uh, they had a terrible forum. And it, it made it a lot harder to actually find and ask for help. Um, so now that they've actually, I think I got it up already, they've moved to uh, the Discord system, which seems to be on Vogue. Uh, JMonkey Engine having a proper forum and a proper community, that's a big deal. Um, they've actually always had a... They've, uh, got a very loyal, um, strong community. I've actually had a lot of people request this particular document. There's a lot of interest in this engine, and there's a lot of support in the community for it. But they never really had a forum, pun not intended, uh, to actually discuss these things. So now that they've moved to this discourse forum, as opposed to the horrible software they had before, uh, the community should be getting a lot, um, not necessarily the community itself, but their ability to communicate should get a whole lot better. Uh, so that's a nice positive development. Uh, so essentially, that's it. That's uh, JMonkey Engine, uh, cross-platform, completely free, uh, BSD open source uh, game engine. And as I mentioned at the very, very beginning, uh, version 3.1 just entered alpha and adds iOS support. So with that, it also supports all of the major platforms. Um, once again, you can check out GameFromScratch.com for a text equivalent of this video. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Bye.